here. Uh, this movie is awesome. I love it. It's still my number one movie in 10 years since I met you in Chicago the first time. You don't remember me at all, but I remember you. And uh, it's enlightening. And I was wrong. It's veganism and vegan is still mentioned in the movie. Sorry. <laughs> um, did you have a, a perspective of speciesism awareness before you ventured into making this documentary? <clears throat> I had some sense of the idea that we should take non-human animals more seriously than we do. And I had an idea about factory farming. I had come across some information about it, but it wasn't until making the film that I realized how strong the arguments are for fundamentally changing how we view all of the other species with which we share the planet. And most notably, uh, I didn't expect the arguments for going vegan to be as strong as they are. In fact, I didn't think that um, the movie would even talk about veganism when I first made the film. Interesting. And I didn't, I didn't go vegan until like partway through making the film. So speaking with the philosophers, especially uh, during the process of making the film is actually what persuaded me um, to go vegan, which uh, a lot of people, um, don't realize because they think that I'm just pretending to not be vegan initially, but but um, I actually wasn't vegan when I started making the film. And as you see in the film, I realized that all of the different objections that one uh, can make to going vegan are fairly easily refuted. And therefore we're left if we want to be logically consistent and ethical with uh, a strong case for changing our diets. That's awesome, man. I appreciate that because uh, I've never heard the term speciesism until you made the movie. And it's been around since before 1974. Uh, so yeah. that my second question too, that you already uh, you became vegan during the movie because I was going to ask you that in the same context, uh, did you know that uh, while making the movie, when did it, in the middle of the movie, actually it was 40 minutes into it before the speciesism question came up. Mm -hmm. uh, did you also... Um, have that speciesism come up at that point while making the movie? Or like I said, you're making it from the very beginning, knowing it was going to be speciesism. I didn't know, I certainly didn't know the movie was going to be called speciesism. Uh, I didn't um, have a, I, I, I was, I, I knew that there was a term speciesism and I knew that there was a philosophical case for taking non-human animals more seriously than we do. But I didn't think that the concept of speciesism was going to be the central focus of the film until, as you saw, uh, Bruce Friedrich brought it up in the context of how we view animals, I, I think, on factory farms. Um, but most notably, I didn't really think through the consequences of the concept of speciesism being a legitimate description of our bias uh, against taking the interests of non-human animals seriously. So I thought, for instance, well, the arguments for taking non-human animals seriously are uh, strong arguments, of course, you know, they can suffer, so we should take their suffering into consideration. But I didn't really realize that if you think about the concept of speciesism, the idea that we draw a sharp distinction between humans and non-human animals and have a profoundly different um, notion of what our ethical obligations are to those on one side or the other of this divide. Once you see that as a really powerful psychological um, phenomenon, you realize that in yourself, when you think about issues pertaining to animals, non-human animals, and you think about issues pertaining to uh, what we eat, when you confront the idea of having a speciesist bias, of assuming that humans are at a, a totally different moral plane than non-human animals, 
uh, once you confront that, you realize that so many things that you sort of came up with convenient excuses for, like the way we use animals in agriculture and our food choices, uh, really fall apart very rapidly. Like as an example, uh, people talk about, well, it, maybe uh, it's not that big of a deal if animals are treated, you know, this much better. Uh, you know, they're on like, for example, the, the turkey farm that you saw. Um, if you're not a speciesist, uh, you could ask, well, would it be okay to treat, you know, human infants or intellectually disabled humans or whatever uh, in, in that way? Uh, keep them in certain conditions like that or do certain experiments on them. Uh, when, you, when you put humans in the place of non-human animals, especially humans who would have a similar uh, level of awareness uh, of their environment in certain ways so that they would suffer a similar amount, we realize how species it is to justify various ways in which we treat non-human animals when there's some conceivable benefit to us that we would never do to humans. So when we really confront that and think of that as a bias that we can't logically justify, uh, it really changes, I think, very profoundly how we think of all of these issues involving how we treat non-human animals. And of course, it makes the way we treat animals in agriculture one of, if not the most significant ethical problems in the world today. Yeah, as a scene in the movie where the kid in the car you're interviewing, and he just snaps. I, that was the, the epitome of the movie for me and what made me stick with it since. I think this question has already been partly answered. How was or how has your perspective changed since the production of the movie? You know, it really did seem to be the case that even though I understood abstractly the idea of there being a strong argument for taking non-human animals seriously, it, it really takes time to change your paradigm because it's an absolute world changing thing. When you take non-human animals seriously, well, all of a sudden, everyone who matters and everyone whose interests should be taken seriously and all sorts of policy issues uh, are not just the humans. They're the thousands of other species um, across the planet. And once we really wrap our heads around the idea that we're one species that has um, certain characteristics that allow us to have a big impact on the world, namely our generalized cognition and the language abilities that are connected with that that allow us to transmit things culturally and therefore do things like building roads and knocking down forests and all that. Uh, once we realize that we're one species of animal that happens to have this particular characteristic that gives us all this power, but that there isn't something about humans per se that is like some magic moral spark that makes us profoundly more important than other species. I think it really is hard for that not to, once you let it sink in, to really change how you view practically everything in the world, including yourself and the other humans around you. Uh, so just as you said with that, that moment with the uh, cinematographer in the car, uh, when you really start waking up to how serious this makes, how we treat and interact with other species, how much of a moral issue suddenly comes to the surface, it, um, it takes some time to sink in. And the, the initial logical argument doesn't necessarily get you to the point where you, you realize how significant this is. But as it sinks in, and that's what I tried to portray in the film, the different ways that you can sort of over time change your perception. Once it sinks in, it, it, it really is a different world. And I, I think it was part somewhere, part way through the film that it, it wasn't a specific moment. It, it just, it, it started changing as I started, I continued engaging these issues. And I, I think that's what is the case with many people. As you learn about it, you, you realize more and more how deep and profound this, this topic. Yeah, I wish I had a transcript actually, I think, it, or some cliff notes. I'm gonna actually watch it again sometime and actually write some of these things down on a, a sheet just so I could have something for reference because it's, it's a lot to remember and there's a lot of great perspectives that 
can shift people, you know, when you communicate with them. So I got two more questions. One quick one. Uh, how long did it take you to make the film? I actually made it over a period of seven years, but I was also in school during that time, part of the time, you know, an undergrad and so on. So I was sort of making it on and off over time. Uh, m probably more than half of the filming, at least the, the uh, filming out in the field where we're going to different places at the factory farms and different things like that. Um, a lot of that was, if you put it together, was done probably in only a fraction of the overall time that I was, that I was working um, on the film. But it was technically, it was on and off for nearly seven years. That's it's incredible. The other question is, what compelled you to make this film and or what was your motivation? Yeah, as you see in the film itself, I actually came across PETA and the PETA um, materials about factory farming and about animal experimentation. And since I already cared about animals, I thought, oh, well, that's um, this is something to be concerned about. So I started looking into the issue and, and then it just occurred to me at some point that I, this would be an issue that there should be a documentary film about. And at the time that I started this film, there wasn't any other, really any documentary film, uh, at least that had much uh, noticeable impact. Um, so I thought, well, this, this topic is ripe for not just a documentary, but this particular style of documentary where you're, you're, investigating the arguments and ideas and hopefully it helps persuade you to, to see the world differently by the end. I'm glad you made it actually, this is awesome. This question, I, I can't know if I'm gonna get it right. What about something cage-free eggs? Brown, what is that word? Brown, who wrote that down? Brown? Brown cage-free eggs, do you know anything about that? Yeah, well, there are a few different considerations. One is that the difference between the brown and the white eggs, um, uh, in my understanding, I'm sorry, what? Uh, no, the egg, I, I finally got it. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. What I was referring to. <laughs> that, I, don't that's what I, so I don't know. <laughs> that's what I thought at least, yeah. Um, so the, the brown versus white eggs, before we get into cage versus cage free, the brown versus white eggs seem to, um, in my understanding, be about uh, just the, the um, breed of the chicken who is laying the egg. Uh, and you can tell the difference between chickens who will um, lay brown or white eggs by uh, uh, the color of uh, uh, something uh, near their face, I, I think. Um, so it's the brown eggs uh, versus white eggs themselves don't um, say anything about the welfare or the conditions of the animals. But in terms of cage-free versus caged eggs, there are actually many different categories of each. So uh, at the time that this film was made, uh, it, almost entirely um, batter cages were almost entirely the, the types of cages that were used. And these were cages, as you see in the film, that um, have the birds standing on metal wire for the entire year and a half of their lives and being extremely densely packed and causing the, the extreme suffering that, that you see in the film. Um, now there have been a few more places that have what are called um, colony cages, which are technically a type of cage, but it's like several sort of connected cages with perches and stuff. So there's a little bit less suffering. There are still a, lo a lot of the problems remain uh, and in terms of the social structures and in terms of um, health issues and, and confinement, the confinement itself and their diets and so on. Uh, but there's somewhat less suffering uh, than there is when, for example, they don't have a perch at all because perches are very important for their bone strength. Um, and as we know, especially because of all the calcium depletion, birds in cages, birds used for eggs in general, um, have very brittle bones that, that uh, break easily. And uh, um, as you saw in the, 
the film, many birds die and are left in the cages. So the colony cages improve upon some, uh, some things. Now for free range, it, um, free range or cage free, I should say, cage free systems will, um, the, the most like standard cage free systems or many of them will have the, the birds very similarly situated to those in the broiler farms that you saw. Those are the meat chickens. So you saw the big warehouse with all of the birds on the floor. Uh, as you saw in the film, that has its own set of problems. And in the case of cage free, uh, the, the basic cage free standard, I should put it, of, of having these birds um, in the sheds instead of in cages, well, their welfare is largely determined by the management. So in poorly managed um, cage-free systems of that type, the litter that they're standing on can become acidic as a result of their droppings and cause them burns on their legs, which are very painful and can leave them in severe pain for a prolonged time. Also, uh, there can be um, issues with birds who are, well, actually just, just to back up, that's, let me just use that example. Other examples can include ammonia levels and things like that. But a, a good example is the issue of the litter, which has to be changed um, out more and cleaned uh, like a broiler shed. So a really good, uh, so, so once you switch from standard battery cages or from colony cages to a cage-free system that's on a floor, you have new issues that management has to take into account. And large numbers of these facilities, based upon the undercover investigations that are done at randomly selected facilities, large numbers of factory farm facilities uh, have very serious uh, management problems to this day, which is, of course, what you'd expect if the animals are commodities and the purpose of their being raised is to maximize the outcomes from a production standpoint, not to think of their interests um, as mattering for their own sake. So uh, all that, the last thing, I don't want to, to, to go on too much with that, but the point is uh, there's, there's a great deal of complexity in terms of the differences between different types of systems. Some can be more or less good than others, but it is not as straightforward as cage versus uh, cage free. There are really complex issues involving different systems and subsystems and management. And now, of course, most notably, um, these all still run into the problem of if we're not speciesist, if we think that the interests of these animals matter to a comparable degree as human interests, then we have to say, is the suffering or potential suffering um, in these systems worth uh, the benefit that we or conceivably someone else are getting out of it? And um, if we don't have to use animal products, then it seems to me difficult to justify um, a, even higher welfare systems if they are necessarily as a result of being commodities uh, not going to have their interest taken into to comparable consideration or anywhere near comparable consideration with human interest. Uh, here's an interesting one because uh, you didn't cover this in the movie. Um, what about insects? Do they have moral worth uh, when people fry up worms or beetles? Is that uh, moral? Well, it seems that the question is, if the ethical principle that we're applying is that causing harm, and specifically causing suffering, is a bad thing, then if insects can suffer, then it would seem that we should take their interests into account. Uh, right now, there appears to be uncertainty about whether insects can suffer. And there's also, um, to the extent that's, that they can, it, it may be some species of insects and not others. For example, um, there's the strongest evidence that 
bees and spiders can feel pain at least uh, because bees and spiders um, have complex behaviors that would require uh, a certain level of awareness. Uh, although the extent to which they experience physical pain is, um, is still relatively uncertain because there are some, for example, experiments that show that insects don't reduce the use of a leg that's been injured uh, or something like that, which would indicate that they're not experiencing a pain reaction. So it's, it's a complex whether or not insects can, can experience pain, uh, even though it seems like the strongest case would be for bees and, and spiders, uh, if anyone can. But nonetheless, it seems like if we're not certain, we might as well give them the benefit of the doubt if we're applying the principle of opposition to causing suffering and they may be capable of suffering, then we might as well, it seems as a matter of logic extending from this principle, uh, it seems that we ought to take their interests um, into account to the extent possible and at least err on the side of caution and avoid uh, causing harm to insects uh, when we can. And especially if they're considered property, there's that conversation. Uh, here's another one, chicken related. Uh, we have, I don't know, this uh, Grove Ladder Farms selling chickens that have been raised truly free range and are slaughtered by the people who raise them. Do you believe these chickens suffer? Well, I can't say about those particular chickens the extent to which they suffer, because if you're talking about that specific facility, um, that's an empirical question. Do they suffer, right? But the question of whether it is justifiable to raise and kill chickens in that fashion is uh, more, more broad rather than this specific facility. And it seems like uh, there are two considerations. Number one, broadly, um, the, um, the, it, it is important to note that there are differences, just like differences between different types of factory farms, like I described with a, a cage-free system versus a colony cage versus battery cages. I think there are substantial differences. I think the evidence is quite clear that there are substantial differences in the amount of suffering that occur with different types of facilities. So if there are facilities where, for example, the animals social and emotional and physical needs are um, deliberately being met. For example, they're kept in social groups that uh, allow them to have social interactions and that they're not bred so quickly that they're collapsing under their own weight and so on. That would certainly be less suffering than let's say at a standard factory farm. Uh, again, I can't comment on a specific farm in the abstract, but we can, there, there is good evidence that there's that not all facilities are the same and all, not all different types of farming are the same. Uh, that said, there seem to be two issues uh, that would be uh, causes for concern about these types of higher welfare farms. One is that when people are buying from the higher welfare farms instead of um, reducing their consumption of animal products in general, if they're replacing rather than reducing their animal products, then what often seems to happen is that people seem to eat the standard factory farm products the rest of the time. So for example, if someone says, I, I buy from these more humane farms, generally, if you ask, well, how often do you, and are you vegan the rest of the time when you can't access like this, these eggs or this meat from this one facility, generally people, people say no, they, they will buy it for like their kitchen some of the time. And then when they go to a restaurant, they just eat the meat. And when they go to a, uh, you know, you know, elsewhere, they, they eat what's available. So the higher welfare farms sort of can create a bit of um, a, an illusion in the sense that when you look at most individuals behavior, they don't exclusively buy from, let's say, a farm where they observed the treatment of animals the whole time and know the people and all this, and then the rest of the time they're vegan, which would basically make them pretty much vegan. 
Um, instead, it, it seems that they only substituted part of the time and then the rest of the time they're, they're eating the animal products um, from anywhere. Uh, so as a result, uh, it seems like from a policy or, or like um, advocacy standpoint, there's a lot of value in focusing on the reducing and eliminating the animal products aspect over um, replacing them. Because again, it seems like when people are asked to replace them, they replace a small portion of the animal products and then they, they don't actually change the rest of their diet generally. Uh, that's, what it, that's what appears to be uh, commonly the case. Uh, the other consideration as we've discussed before is the issue with property, with the animals being commodities, where if we look more broadly at our society, if we think the interests of non-human animals are of comparable worth to, the, to human interests, then it is hard to justify in the long term, broadly as a society, using animals, raising and killing them where they're raised and killed for our benefit uh, and, at, and therefore viewing them as property or commodities in the marketplace and seriously saying that we are anti-species and take their interests into comparable consideration with human interests. Because again, we, we would never do that with humans. Um, even if we were raising the humans um, better. So there's the practical issue about reducing versus replacing where reducing or eliminating animal products seems to actually affect behavior better and more thoroughly. And then if we think in the long term that the issue that comes up is this issue of their property or commodity status being at odds with taking their interests um, into comparable consideration with human interests. I think that answered that pretty good. All right, we got, would you expect different points of view from non-American people? Did you talk to anyone from uh, third world countries? Uh, different points of view about what? About speciesism or about uh, diet change? Yeah, that sounds right, right? Yes. Yes, meaning which? Uh, about speciesism. Ah, OK. Uh, yeah, I think um, the the new film that I'm working on presently, actually, uh, now that I am able to have a little bit of a bigger budget, I am actually able to go overseas and uh, spend more time speaking with people all over the world, which uh, has really been uh, great. And I'm looking forward to, to the new film uh, being released probably in uh, 2023. So one answer is that that, that's in the next one. But secondly, um, in different, I wouldn't say different countries specifically, but different cultures think about ethical reasoning in different ways. So the Western tradition with ethical reasoning has to do with thinking in terms, um, in, in the way that Socrates um, initially laid out with literally the Socratic method. So the way that we talk about and discuss the issue in different cultures, Western versus non-Western especially, is going to lead to, to different ways of describing um, the, the questions and in different ways of answering them about the, about the moral status of some particular group. But that being said, every culture, uh, every system of ethics that is actually widely used in any society includes the notion that all else being equal causing harm is bad. That's why you see the golden rule um, everywhere from the golden rule that we're familiar with in the West to an almost identical statement uh, from Confucius and the ancient Chinese tradition. So the idea of taking the interests of others into consideration and avoiding harming them as a very general matter are um, fundamental across the world. And that's not surprising because ethics has an evolutionary basis. It didn't come out of nowhere. Uh, we evolved to have certain um, concepts of ethics that developed when we existed in small societies. So taking that into account, uh, the logic of the argument for taking non-human animals seriously 
proceeds from the premises that are present across the world. And that's what I'm seeing in the new film. In terms of developing countries or places where people aren't able to have their basic needs met, I think if I understand the question correctly, it's more of a practical question about um, how people who are not able to meet their basic needs would respond to um, being told to view non-human animals differently. And that's not an issue specifically of non-human animals, but an issue of as you would expect from, let's say, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs as a, as a good framework. When people don't have their basic needs met, it is going to be more difficult for them to take the interests of others into consideration and especially to, um, to expand their moral circle to include previous outgroup and especially to think about abstract moral reasoning. If you're concerned about having to walk you know, several miles to get a small amount of fresh water, um, it makes sense that you're not going to have the space for thinking about intellectual arguments about taking, um, about rethinking concepts of ethics. Of course, that is not a flaw in the arguments. It's an understandable situation where in order to do anything beyond meeting one's basic needs, one to be, has to be able to meet their basic needs first. So I wouldn't expect people who are, um, unable to meet their basic needs to spend much time not just thinking about speciesism but thinking about racism or climate change or any other issues that are in fact very serious issues uh, but simply uh, are outside of what a particular individual who's let's say trying to um, have enough water to drink can can spend time thinking about or engaging with. The last thing I will add about that is that uh, one of the reasons, it appears to be the case that one of the reasons that our moral circle is expanding the way it is, including the extension to non-human animals, is uh, in part that our own conditions are getting better. As a larger percentage of the population is listed out, uh, lifted out of extreme poverty where they can't meet their basic needs, as people have uh, more access to education, and this is happening slowly, but uh, surely these sorts of things, uh, that seems to coincide with an expansion of our circle of ethical concern. There are other factors involved with making that expanding circle happen, but this is likely one of them. And, um, so that is why we would expect that once people are able to do things like have certain basic needs met and have be in, in relative physical safety and so on, that they're able to, like most of us here in the United States, are able to spend time thinking about and um, deciding to make changes in our lives for the benefit of out groups that we hadn't considered in the past. All right. And this is the last card from the audience. Uh, I think it's more of a, an expression of thanks or appreciation. Since uh, your movie, we have had the uh, COVID-19 virus come out and it looks like nothing has changed. Uh, nothing changed until we stop killing and eating animals. And thank you for a great movie. Thanks very much for saying so. Oh, thank you. Jaden. So you, you're, you're not making speciesism two. It's not gonna be speciesism two, is it? <laughs> no, uh, no, that's not the film I'm making, but, but there are uh, certain relevant, um, uh, uh, certain, th there's, there's overlap. Uh, I, the new film, involves a discussion of rethinking how we view non-human animals. And uh, some of the things that are discussed in speciesism are also discussed, I think, in new and interesting ways in the new film. 
Uh, there's also a lot more original investigation around the world and um, I think particularly interesting interviews, people I wouldn't have been able to reach uh, for this first film when I was an undergraduate. So uh, there are there are some, uh, there is some uh, continuity between speciesism and the new film, but the new film is also um, uh, in a lot of ways, uh, quite, quite a new concept. Okay. Uh, I'm being uh, kind of vague because I'm not supposed to release information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you get the idea. It disclosed that. Yeah, I was going to say, do you feel since making the um, this movie that you missed anything in it after finishing it or that you should uh, make a sequel and then also uh, maybe even a deeper inquiry into the solutions, uh, you know, like history origin of our species in this and then the solutions of course that's the easy answer for anyone who wants to go vegan yeah i i would say that in terms of things that i left out of the first film i would say honestly it to me um i'm surprised that even as I look back on it now and then when I think about it because of, you know, so let's say conversation about this, or I'm thinking about it in the context of the new film, I'm pretty happy with it having covered all of the main bases for the discussion of these issues, like the different objections to changing our diet and uh, the different objections to taking non-human animals seriously and the different types of factory farming and so on. Um, I'm, I'm fairly, I'm, I'm surprised that things don't seem to have come up that I thought were gaping holes where I, I would have wanted to do something uh, really differently. I think the main thing that I would have done differently, which I am doing in the, the new film is simply um, having a big professional crew that can make the movie look, um, visually <laughs> yeah so like things like the camera cutting off somebody's head or something like that yeah we have, we've got that worked out now yeah we have uh, more modern technology now after 10 years so well That's we're true. on about the end of this uh, zoom uh, we i don't know if they, they didn't cut me off at 40 minutes uh but we i want to thank you personally plus uh i'm sure everybody else here that uh appreciates your movie and uh, it's a great for the cause and it needed to be done and uh, I'll, I'll keep it on my shelf for the rest of my life uh, as well as the notes. Uh, good luck on your next one. When do you think that will come out? Um, I'm estimating around 2023 uh, and I'm, I would say probably 2023. Um, obviously there were some delays with COVID as you, as you would expect, uh, but it's coming along very well. And thank you uh, all very much for, uh, for being here. And I hope that my answers to the written questions uh, provided you with some of the answers that you were looking for, for those of you who submitted those questions. And I look forward to you all seeing the, the new film. And I, I hope that you find, that you continue to find this film uh, useful. I'm, I'm glad whenever I hear people say that this film has been useful to them and useful for educating friends and family members about these issues. I'm, I'm always so so glad that I was able to, to do something that has been a, of, of such, um, such use to people in so many different places. So I'm, I'm always very glad to hear that. And uh, again, I, I really appreciate everyone's um, interest in the film and most importantly, concern about this issue of how we treat all of the other species on the planet. All right, awesome, and thanks for allowing us to uh, screen this and uh, zooming in with us. It's just been a great pleasure. Thank you. So. Uh, Take care now, Mark. Bye.